Well, amen. What a good reminder and a good question. What if we centered our whole lives, everything that we are, on Jesus Christ? Um, well, hey, we want to welcome you again uh, to Radiant Church. My name is Ben, and I have the privilege of serving as the site pastor here in Ankeny. We're just so glad uh, that you're here. I hope you're excited to be here. Um, I know I am, and I'm excited uh, for, for the word that I believe God uh, has, has put on my heart and, and on our hearts uh, here. And so uh, I want to start off by uh, confessing something to you. Uh, get, getting something off my chest really is what I'm going to be doing. It's something that's kind of bold, and so uh, this is a safe place, right? I can do that. I can, you know, confess what's on my mind, okay? Uh, here's the confession. It's this. It's simply put... Um, I did not like the Star Wars movie. I know. Okay, okay. Wow, wow. I was expecting a little more, actually. But that's good. That's fine. I heard a couple boos. It's a good way to encourage your pastor, but whatever. Okay, um, <laughs> it's fine. Uh, but no, 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 no. Okay, before, before you boo me, okay, I'm not talking about the latest Star Wars movie. I'm talking about the one right before it called The Last Jedi, okay? Any cheers? Any applauds? Okay, you guys don't care. Okay, my wife, had, my wife reminded me, she's like, they don't know which one you're talking about when you say Last Jedi. It's the, it's the second one of the new ones. Oh, okay, thanks. All right, anyway, the point is, <laughs> the point is I had problems with this movie. Now, I consider myself to be somewhat of a Star Wars nerd, okay? I have Darth Vader little figurines from 1977. I have a little Star Wars coffee mug that I drink out of. Um, I have Stormtrooper pajama pants, so, which my wife no longer allows me to wear in public, <laughs> okay? And yes, I said no longer allows me to wear in public because there's a story there, but that's not the point, okay? That's for another time, okay? But, but I love Star Wars, man. I love, like, the original trilogies. I'm kind of the purist where it's like, don't give me all that stuff they added in later, okay? Give me what? I, give me the true versions of it, okay? So I went into this with certain expectations. You see, the movie before that ended with our hero, Ray extending the famous lightsaber to Luke Skywalker, right? A lightsaber that had meant so much to Star Wars, represented so much, and here you have this moment. And so I went in super excited. You know, Luke's going to take the lightsaber. He's going to be this hero that I've grown to know and love. That's his character, right? And I went in, and what does Luke Skywalker do? He takes the lightsaber and does what? Anyone know? He throws it over his shoulder, okay? Are you kidding me? Come on. It broke my little heart, okay, is what happened. Um, I, didn't, I, 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 was, I was baffled by this. I said, that's not the Luke Skywalker that I've, that I've come to expect. And I had problems with it, and it kind of set the tone for the rest of the film with me, okay? Like, uh, leave alone Kylo and Rey, I could feel the conflict within me, you know what I'm saying? And Luke Skywalker has a line in this movie that I think perfectly sums it up. He sums up the, the movie experience for me, and he says this line. He says, this is not going to go the way you think. This is not going to go the way you think. And it didn't. Have any of you here in this room experienced disappointment in life where things didn't go the way that you thought they would? I know I have, right? And it's not just Star Wars that I'm talking about, but, but even in our marriages. Those of us who have been married before, those of us who are, are married now, whatever it is, we have oftentimes experienced true disappointment in our lives. You see, we have certain expectations going into our relationship, certain hopes and desires. Jason introduced this topic, uh, this idea last week. We're continuing on in our uh, sermon series called For Better or Worse as we focus on marriage and relationships. And he introduced this idea of, of our expectations, two different people having desires, hopes, an idea of what it's going to look like. He said it's like two trains barreling down the track at one another that will eventually collide. It's so true. And the question, the way, what do we want to zero in here today a little bit is we want to ask the question, are you aware of your expectations? The expectations you've put on your spouse, your future spouse, your previous spouse, whatever it is, are you at least aware of your expectations? And, and asking a, a deeper question, what if those expectations aren't actually good expectations? What if those expectations were, were starting from a premise that was wrong to begin with? What do we do with that? So to begin uh, today's kind of conversation a little bit here today, um, we need to just get something out. It's a simple truth. The truth of the matter is that every single one of us in the room, we all have expectations, don't we? 
Every single one of us sitting here, we have certain hopes and ideas about how things will go. Um, You here today, you have certain expectations about how this service was going to go. Maybe you expected to come in and worship freely. You expected to hear a good message to connect with people. Those are good expectations. We have expectations about things like that new job, that new venture that we're starting off on. Expectations about how that movie is going to turn out. And we certainly have expectations that we place on our relationships and especially our marriages as well. Let me just give you a couple examples of the expectations that we kind of bring into marriage. Um, For instance, we have expectations about who is going to take out the trash, right? Okay, real quick, just as an experiment, raise your hand if your spouse is responsible for taking out the trash. Raise it up right now. Don't be shy. Come on. Raise it up. Raise it up. Raise it up. Raise it up. Okay? I probably just started a fight in some of your marriages. I'm sorry about that, okay? Some of you are like, "Uh, are you sure? I didn't think it was, okay? We have expectations, for instance, surrounding dinner time. Is dinner time a time where you simply just kind of quickly consume your food and move on with your evening? Or is it a time where you gather together and talk about your day, you sit down, you relax? We have expectations about who in the relationship is going to bring in the bacon, for instance. Who's going to be the breadwinner? Expectations about who will discipline the kids. How faith will be involved in your relationship. We get these expectations that we all have. We get these expectations from a variety of different places. The biggest one, the biggest source of our expectations, I think, comes from our families, right? We have a certain idea and a certain picture of what marriage and relationships going to be like. Uh, for many of us, we saw our parents and how they reacted. And so we have those expectations that we oftentimes bring in. Some of us, for, for most of us, we're surrounded in, a, in an American culture. And so our culture tells us all sorts of things about how marriage should go. Other things, other different uh, influences in our expectations, things like our experiences in life, our theology, what the Bible says. For honest, sometimes Disney can influence our expectations, right? Living happily ever after. But sometimes I think, if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes even our own selfishness and our sinfulness can affect our expectations that we put on our spouse. We talked about that a little last week. If you were to ask me, what what is the greatest, probably the greatest source for the most amount of people of marital conflict? I think the greatest source of marital conflict is unmet expectations. Unmet expectations. I think it's the source of so many conflicts, not not only our marriage, but in our relationships. We're expecting the other person to behave one way. We're expecting things to go the way that we think. And it turns out completely different. What do we do with that? I love how James writes it in chapter 4. He sums it up so perfectly. He speaks to our hearts. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, that battle within you? I love that rhetorical question at the end. It's so true. The reason we fight and we bicker with one another is because we have desires. We have expectations that we put on one another. For me, when I went into that movie, The Last Jedi, I I had expectations of the old Luke Skywalker. This hero, this master, this trainer. Instead, I got a broken man who had suffered defeat and disappointment. What do we do with that when it happens in our marriages as well? Um, When I'm doing premarital counseling with couples, there's a curriculum called Prepare and Rich, which I love to use uh, with couples. But there's an exercise that I uh, oftentimes will walk through with couples. And it basically lists out a bunch of different uh, couple fantasies, these fantastic ideas about how marriage will look and work. Here's uh, just a quick list. This is about half of them. But it has statements on here that you're meant to go through and mark which ones you believe to be true. It's statements like, my partner will meet all my needs for companionship. Time will resolve our problems. If I have to ask, it's not as meaningful. We should live happily ever after with no major problems. Now, those of you who have been married long enough know you look at this list and you say, "Uh uh-uh, that ain't reality, right? But for a young couple, it's important to be able to walk through these expectations, these desires, these, these hopes and these dreams and be able to talk about it, how life may not go the way you think. What do we do? 
What do we do when we're in a marriage that isn't meeting our expectations? How do we move forward from that? I want to dive in to see what scripture says. I believe the Bible um, holds so many truths that apply to relationships in general. And I, I, want to, I want to dive in and take a look about what we find here in scripture. And I believe what we find time and time again throughout the Bible is that we need to recognize that, that oftentimes God doesn't meet people's expectations in scripture. Oftentimes people have one idea of who God is or they expect one thing of him and he goes a completely different route. Um, for instance, take the Israelites for example. Here you have the Israelite people who are slaves in Egypt, toiling and toiling and toiling. Finally, God delivers them as they chase after the promised land, but first they have to wander through the desert. It's hard, it's difficult, it's hot, and there's sand everywhere. And here you have these people begin to grumble. Things aren't going the way they thought they would. They begin to complain. They say, God, we want food like we used to have. We want bread, we want meat. So God sort of appeases them. In Exodus chapter 16, God says this to his people. He says, tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know what it was, right? The word manna, right, this bread that appeared on the ground, the word literally means, what is it? What on earth is this that you just gave us, God? You said you were going to give us bread to fill our bellies, and yet you gave us this? What gives? And we read here, you know, the purpose behind it was that God says, so that you will know that I am the Lord your God. Later in Deuteronomy, it says to humble them and to test them. See, they expected a certain kind of bread. They expected a bread that they could they could save up and store up and eat whenever they wanted and instead God gave them a different kind of bread a bread that dissolved every day a bread that they couldn't store up and keep for themselves why because God was reminding them that he was their daily bread that all the that it wasn't necessarily bread itself that they were after but instead they were after security They were after purpose. They wanted safety. God knew that those things could only be found in him. It wasn't bread that they desired. They desired God. And that's who they should have put their faith in. I think we can see here from the story of the Israelites is that that sometimes God uses our unmet expectations to grow us deeper in relationship. God uses those moments of disappointment to to grow us into a deeper relationship with him and with other people. He did it with the Israelites. I think not only does does he do it to to grow us deeper in relationships, but I I think sometimes God doesn't meet our expectations because if we're honest with ourselves, our expectations are way too low. Our expectations are are shallow sometimes, if we're honest with ourselves. We're not aiming high enough. For instance, there was a crowd that was gathering around Jesus because they had heard about his miracles, and they they wanted to find out, is this guy really actually from God? And so the crowds began to sort of test him and prod and ask, and the crowds asked him in verse 30 in John 6, the crowds asked Jesus, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you. What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. You see, they wanted a sign. They wanted to say, hey, Jesus, if, if you're claiming to be from God and you're wanting us to believe in you, show us. We want a sign. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it's not Moses who, gave, who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is the Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. 
For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. See, these crowds that were gathering around Jesus, they wanted signs from God. Jesus was looking at him and saying, don't you understand? You're with him. You're with God. I am he. I am the bread of life. Come, partake. Feast on me. Their expectations were too low. Isn't that true of us sometimes? We want to see God do certain things or behave certain ways or see miracles happen in our lives. And the whole time, I think sometimes God's saying, your expectations are too low. You can have all of me living within your spirit, giving you power to live every single day, relationship and presence with the Holy Creator. Folks, I think we are setting the bar too low sometimes in our expectations. And sometimes God doesn't meet them because they are too low. I think this can be true in our marriages and our relationships too. I think sometimes the, the very things that drive us the most crazy about our significant others are oftentimes the thing that God is trying to use to shape us into his likeness. I'm not talking about necessarily the sinful things. I'm talking about the ways that God is trying to chisel things off of us to round us out as a person. God oftentimes uses those people closest to us in order to grow us, to teach us, to reveal those things inside of us that we may not have recognized before. I love the way Max Lucado writes it. He writes it this way. He writes, unmet expectations are, are tough when it's your wife or your husband. But it's really tough when it's God. And yet, it can be a time of growth and a time of faith and a time of understanding who God is. What do we do when we're in a relationship that isn't meeting our expectations? I think one of the most crucial things we can do is I think we need to check the motivation, check the motives behind the expectation. What is it that's driving this desire in me? What is it that's driving this hope, this picture that I painted in my mind about how this would go? When I was a young boy in, uh, in elementary school, one of, my, um, one of the best things that happened while I was in school was uh, being able to play a game on the computer called Oregon Trail. Anybody? Okay. Oregon Trail was like it. Like, it was, the, it was the goal, okay? It was like the best reward uh, ever, right? This game was incredible. And uh, good on teachers for finding a way to be like, hey, you got your work done. Now play this educational game to learn about the Oregon Trail. Like, nice job, teachers, okay? And I loved this game, right? I thought it was hilarious every single time that, I, you know, my brother that I entered on. I, I thought it was hilarious when my brother died of dysentery, you know what I mean? And it wasn't until later that I found out what, like, dysentery was, <laughs> And it was funnier to me even then, okay? That, and my immaturity, of course, in the game, okay? But the Oregon Trail was, it was a crucial part in American history for those Americans wanting to emigrate uh, west and explore new lands. It was a crucial part, for instance, to the California gold rush that began in 1848. But what's fascinating about the Oregon Trail is that one out of every ten died. From accidents, from diseases, one out of every ten people who embarked on this journey out west died. And yet thousands upon thousands of people decided to do it anyway. Why? I think it's because these, these people wanted something more. They, they had this idealistic vision about what it would mean to live out west. They had this picture in their mind and they were willing to risk it to get to the other side. Why do, the same question can be asked of people wanting to get married. Why are so many people wanting to embark on the journey of marriage when the statistics show that so many of them ultimately fail? 
as tragic as it is. The truth is, it's because you start off. You start off with an idealistic vision. What you hope to bring it. What you hope it brings your life and what you hope it brings you. And ultimately, you're looking for something. See, just like the people in America back in the, the 1800s, went out to California, the reality is, is true for us here today. The reality is this, we are all on a treasure hunt. You and me are on a treasure hunt. We're all pursuing something in life. Our, our life's goals, our, our purposes, we're all chasing after something, whether you've named it or you haven't. So many of us, I think, enter into marriages with this sort of idealistic vision that we're going to have the perfect family. Our kids are going to be well-behaved. We're going to have the nice house, right? When we go to our relative's house and our our in-laws, it's going to be hunky-dory and there's going to be no problems at all, right? We have this vision about, this this picture about how your spouse is going to help you achieve your career goals. About how your spouse is going to meet all your needs. You'll never be lonely again. You'll never hurt again. They'll serve you and take care of all that you've ever wanted. We are on a treasure hunt, and we're pursuing something. What is it that you're pursuing? Have you named it? Do you know it? Have you thought about it? Author Tim Keller writes it this way. He writes, We come into our marriages driven by all kinds of fears, desires, and needs. If I look to my marriage to fill the God-sized spiritual vacuum in my heart, I will not be in a position to serve my spouse. Only God can fill a God-sized hole. Until God has the, the proper place in my life, I will always be complaining that my spouse is not loving me well enough, not respecting me enough, and not supporting me enough. What he's trying to say here is that as long as I'm I'm placing all my needs on my spouse and I'm expecting them to fill that God-sized vacuum in my heart, as long as I'm expecting that person to do what only God can do, I'm going to end up disappointed. Of course you're going to complain that they're not loving enough, doing enough. So often, I think sometimes we, we look to the horizontal to get a picture of how marriage should work. We look to our culture, we look to what we see on TV, we look to how it was done, and instead of looking horizontally, I think instead we need to start looking vertically. We need to start asking the question of God, God, what do you want to have happen in this marriage? God, what is your purpose for bringing these two broken people together? What are you trying to do? What are you pursuing in your life? What's your life based on? What's it shaped by? All of us are on a treasure hunt. And Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I love this quote by Paul Tripp in the book that this sermon series is based on. He says, we have to deal with what is driving us before we ever deal with how we are reacting to one another. We've got to deal with the disease and not just the symptoms, right? Anyone, any good doctor will treat not just the symptoms, not just the way that the disease is manifesting itself, but you've got to treat the underlying cause as well. What is the underlying purpose and drive of your life? Because if you don't fix that, the symptoms will never go away. Are you willing here today even to confess? Confess to God, confess to that significant other, confess that maybe you've centered your life around something that God never intended? Are you willing to speak it out loud even to your spouse? The book of Amos chapter 3, I love this, it's so true. It says, can two people walk together? without agreeing on the direction. We need, with our relationships and our spouses, we need to come together and we need to determine what is this thing going to be about. 
Because if you don't know the direction, you can't walk together. I want to begin to to sort of uh, close this out by asking just some questions of us here today. Questions that I've been wrestling with uh, throughout the week and thinking about my marriage as well. Um, I've said it already, but the biggest question I think here today is the question, what am I pursuing? What are you pursuing here today? If you took an inventory of your life and you took a closer look at, at who you are and how you're spending your time, what are you really pursuing? There's a famous quote that says, how we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. How are you spending your days? Are you taking every single day to be intentional in your relationships? Are you taking every single day to make this relationship count, giving it over to God and saying, God, I believe you're trying to do something through it? You see, your habits in life tell you a lot more about your beliefs than what you say about your beliefs, right? I'll say it again. The habits that we are forming in our lives, the way we spend our time and our habits in life tell us a lot more about what we actually believe than even what we profess we believe. What do your habits tell you about what you believe? About what you're pursuing in life? Are you willing to confess those expectations that, those expectations that aren't of God? Those desires, those hopes that you've put in things other than Him. Maybe those desires that you've even placed on your spouse to fulfill a role that only God was meant to do. Here today, are, are you willing to lay down some of those expectations? Lay down even those career goals, maybe. Those hopes and those dreams of the perfect family, whatever it is, whatever, whatever you've been clinging on to, are you willing to lay it down and pursue him to the fullest extent? Today I want to ask the question, how is your worship of God? How's your worship? Is it a struggle? Are you spending time with him? Are you getting to know him? How's your love of God, because if you don't start from a place of loving God first, you'll never love your spouse with the type of sacrificial love that we're called to in marriage. How's your worship? Is there any way that you're trying to recreate your spouse in your own image? Expecting them to fulfill something in you. Is there any way that you're still trying to shoehorn those fantasy goals, those fantasy desires and expectations onto your spouse where they were never meant to be? Are you willing to release them to God? A couple weeks ago, I, I finally went back and I watched the Star Wars movie again. <laughs> And I went into it saying to myself, you know what, I'm going to choose to simply appreciate what the director and the writers were trying to do here. I'm going to put my expectations aside, everything that I think Star Wars should be, and I'm going to look at it from a, from a fresh vision. And you know what? I really enjoyed it again. I did. The only reason I enjoyed it was because I was willing to lay down those expectations that, if we're honest, just just weren't realistic in the first place. Those hopes, those desires that (laughs) certainly weren't of God and certainly those things in our marriages that we bring into it, this picture that, if we're honest with ourselves, are just a selfish, selfish dream. I hope today is the day that we begin to start to identify and lay down some of those dreams, those goals, those desires, those things that aren't of God for the purpose of reconnecting with our creator and reconnecting with that man or that woman that God has placed in your life to mold you, to shape you into his likeness.
I pray that each of us would commit to one thing today throughout this week, that you talk about it with your spouse. I pray that each of us would commit to give ourselves to a regular lifestyle of confession and forgiveness. Confession is something that can start even right here and now with God, just saying, God, I give over the things that were never of you in the first place. Confession with your loved ones can start even right after this service. Asking for forgiveness, forgiving them. But I pray that we make this commitment this week. We embrace it. And we don't let this Sunday service just be another thing where we hear nice thoughts, leave, and don't do anything with it. But I pray that we will commit to be a people who follow Christ, who are regularly confessing our sins, who are getting rid of bitterness, resentment, saying, no, that is not what God wants for me in my relationships. And we take on instead a new way recognizing that those hopes and those desires we brought into this, they're, they're, they're far too shallow, that we've set the bar far too low, that God wants to draw us deeper into relationship. He's going to use those disappointments that we're struggling with even here today. And I know some of you are hurting. I know some of you are disappointed with how things turned out. you got to believe got to believe that God is going to do something with it. He's going to turn it into something beautiful. He's going to use it to grow you into the person that he sees for you. His vision, not yours. Will you let him? Will you say yes to him today? you commit your life and your goals and your pursuits and your treasures and your expectations and your desires and every single thing that you've put on yourself, will you give it over to him and say, God, I'm yours. God, I am yours. You do whatever you want in me. I'm tired. I'm tired of doing things my way. It's not working out. I need your way. Your way is better is better. Man, I pray we would be a people that could do that. Give your heart to the only one who can truly secure it. The one who loved you first. Give it fully over to him. And watch as the pieces of your life begin to fall into place. Just watch him. Test him. Worship. Some of you here today, maybe you need to make that commitment to give your whole life over to Jesus, maybe even for the first time. Maybe you need to recommit and just say, God, I, I don't know what I've been doing, but today's the day I need to recommit my life over to you, give you my heart and my soul. Today's the day. Don't miss this. God's trying to do something. Let's pray.